Best known for his legendary tenure at Walt Disney Company, this next speaker comes to the UP Experience to introduce his new book, Working Together, Why Great Partnerships Succeed, and to share his personal stories about our world's most successful collaborations. Please welcome Michael Eisner. Thank you very much. Um, I always made it a rule at Disney never to follow strong Disney music. <laughs> um, I'm here to advocate partnerships, and it's interesting. I wasn't going to talk about Walt Disney and Roy Disney, but all but the last song, the Aladdin song, were created under Walt Disney. And Walt Disney, who is an iconic American figure as many of the partnerships I'm going to talk about are, really could not have existed without his brother Roy. Um, there would be no Walt Disney, well, there'd be a Walt Disney, I guess, but there'd be no Walt Disney Company, there'd be no Disney Productions, there'd be no Pinocchio, there'd be no Snow White, there'd be no Disneyland, there'd be no Walt Disney World without the partnership of these two brothers. One, the younger, impetuous, somewhat egocentric genius, Walt. The other, the older brother, desperately in love with a pain in the ass younger brother, sharing a bed, often wetted by his younger brother, growing up in the Midwest, moving to California, and nurturing his brother, fighting with his brother, making up with his brother, and achieving with his brother. So they just happen to be a pretty iconic example of my thesis, which is don't try to do it alone. Uh, I've experienced uh, three partnerships in my life of incredible significance. Uh, the first and probably most significant is my wife, um, with whom I have, unusual as it may be, in Hollywood, married still for 40 plus years. Um, no, 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 no. That, that, shouldn't, that shouldn't get applause from anybody other than my children. Um, the, uh, but we, everybody, everybody knows there are many different kind of partnerships, and a, a domestic partnership is the most significant. And as all of you who have successful domestic partners know that it's you have a product, and your product is children, and then the other product is your relationship. And having a voice, I, I, I kind of term it in, in my negotiation process with other people as the strength of pillow talk. Never underestimate pillow talk. No matter whom you are negotiating with or trying to make an arrangement with, there's usually somebody that gets the last word before the light goes out. And I've shared that strong um, partnership with my wife, who is not afraid to tell me I'm full of it or uh, calm down or are you really nuts or hey that may be a good idea or why aren't you at the soccer game. So there's, there's that partnership. I've also had two other very interesting partnerships which, which uh, fundamentally uh, molded my thinking about how life works. One was for 10 years, eight of the 10 years I was at the ABC television network and the other was for the eight, of the eight years of the 10 years I was at Paramount Pictures as the president. And that was a man by the name of Barry Diller. And here I learned about partnerships of two 24 to 42 year old men who were competitive yet had an enormous trust with one another um, and who did not understood that the greater good was for the institution, not for the individual. I then went to the Walt Disney Company, and by uh, some sense of luck, I guess, I ended up with a partner by the name of Frank Wells. And the example of how I knew from day one that this was going to be an interesting partnership was that when we were talking about coming to the company, the forces that existed 
thought he having, excuse me, he having come from Warner Brothers, me having come from Paramount, we'd be a good team. We should go in as co-CEOs. I was pretty happy at Paramount and kind of blurted out, you know what, I don't really want to be a co-CEO. I want to be the sole CEO, and if not, I don't think I'm going to do it. And within 30 seconds, 30 seconds, two seconds, Frank said, great, he'll be the CEO, I'll be the COO. He'll be the boss, I'll be number two. And I had learned how to say yes in my career. One of the big problems with executives is sometimes when they get good news, they say, really? Are you kidding? I can do that? Then the person who said yes starts thinking, well, maybe, maybe not. So when somebody says something good to you, just say yes and move on. So uh, I said, okay. And we then forged a 10-year partnership, and it was an enormously successful partnership. It was a selfless partnership. I was the supposedly, had a lot of hair, uh, the crazy creative type. He was supposedly the uh, uh, Stanford-bred Rhodes Scholar lawyer, you know, straight, serious type. And in fact, when our principal shareholder was asked if Michael Eisner was crazy and Frank Wells was the sane one, he said, no, they're both crazy. So in fact, we finished each other's sentences, we corrected each other, we kept each other on a strong moral compass, we kept the company moving ethically in the right direction, we high-fived at success, we sat in the foxhole together during difficult times, and it was a selfless, unbelievable partnership. I, he decided that I should go on television, that, 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 that I should demonstrate to a company that now it had a rudder, because for 18 years since Walt had died, it seemed there was no rudder. I took center stage. He took not center stage, but he was significantly more important than anybody else in the company and equally important to me. And I started thinking about partnerships and what, it, what it's all about. Uh, I thought about um, this whole idea that I've advocated all my career, which is called creativity in a box. I advocated this when I was at ABC at a company that was fourth among three. I advocated it when I was at Paramount at a company that was eight among seven. And I was, going to, I was going to advocate it at the Walt Disney Company. I still advocate it. And that's basically, you create a financial box. I used to one of them, people that worked for me to create it around me. Inside the box, you let the create, creativity, which is inside the box, go wild, do whatever they want, be outrageous. But if you hit that edge of that box, a flag would go up and somebody would walk in with a AK-47 and say, hey, you can be as creative as you want, but this makes no business sense. And many, many partnerships uh, are built around this idea of creativity in a box. One partner could be the sobering, let's stay on budget, while the other partner is the, hey, I got an idea, we're going to go to the moon, or it can be reversed. But you must have that ingrained in your partnership, not only in finance, but in ethics and in your whole sense of direction. I kind of think of this idea of building a brand. Disney was a, obviously is a brand, other brands that I've worked with and I'm working with now. And a brand is kind of like a Surratt painting. It's made of a, uh, thousands of dots. And every single dot, when it's put together, makes this beautiful painting. And if it's a thousand ugly dots, you have an ugly painting. If it's a thousand beautiful dots, you have a beautiful painting. So everything you do has got to be excellent, because everything that is excellent adds to that painting. To the end of the game is you end with a Disney brand. Walt and Roy created this great brand. Most of a lot of the music you just heard, there was a period where the dots were kind of fading. We came in and you know, whether it was live action film or animation, uh, concentrated together as a partnership. So then I decided, you know, this is a pretty good idea, this partnership. 
But we're all taught, you know, well, we're taught correctly in nursery school. You know, don't let your brother throw sand in your sister's face. Don't throw up on your other sibling. You know, be share, share the toy, even though that's against your inner neurological sensibility. Um, and then you go into middle school and high school, and it's all about kill the opponent, individual achievement, get those high SATs, win the award, win the President's Award, you know, become a great athlete. We, we honor iconic individuals. And in fact, most of the iconic individuals that you are aware of have a partner, and they have a strong partner. So I looked at various partnerships and decided I would write, like, you know, Esquire's essays or New Yorker essay or or Vanity Fair essay, about 10 different partnerships. And I looked at some of the big iconic partnerships, spent a lot of time interview each one of them, a Warren Buffett and a Charlie Munger. Most people know Warren Buffett as the Oracle of Omaha, this genius they don't know about Charlie. Uh, the Gateses, a lot of discussions with Bill and Melinda Gates about philanthropy. I studied uh, Ron Howard and Brian Grazer, iconic uh, filmmakers, many, many Academy Awards. I looked at the Home Depot uh, phenomena, the creation with Bernie Marcus and Arthur Blank. I looked at Joe Torre, the Yankee manager, and his bench coach, Don Zimmer. I looked at two fabulous women in California, uh, Mary Sue Milliken and, 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 and her partner, who, uh, who created uh, themselves in the Food Channel and, and, uh, and books and all of that. And actually, uh, you know, they are, uh, they're amazing. They, they, they're compatible, Susan Feniger and Mary Sue. Again, well, they're so compatible they married the same man. So that I don't suggest. Not at the same time, but they did marry the same man. Uh, and I, I looked at, uh, I, I was interested in the, in the period that I grew up in, the Vietnam era, and I was interested in Studio 54 and this, first generation of the birth control pill, Vietnam, Kent State, riots, drugs, and then Studio 54, and this partnership of Steve Rubell and Ian Schrager, and how, how they kind of grew up. And in all these partnerships, this consistent theme of, of one partner kind of being up front, like, like Warren playing the ukulele and being on the cover of Fortune, Charlie Munger in the background, curmudgeon, you know, but with complete trust with each other. And Warren makes it extremely clear that the one thing a partnership has to have is a lack of envy as against the two partners. And as a matter of fact, he talked to me about envy kind of like the seven deadly sins. And he would say, you know, gluttony, you know, it's kind of fun. You go to a restaurant, you eat all the steak and the potatoes and the stuff. Maybe later you need the antacid, you don't feel so good, you gotta go to Weight Watchers, but while you're eating, not so bad. And then Lust says, that's okay, what's going on? Big trouble later, hello Brent Favre and others. But <laughs> while, while it's happening, not so terrible. Envy, it's awful from the moment you feel it to the moment you live through it to the end of it. There is no room for envy. Envy and jealousy destroys the world. And as related to partnerships, all these partnerships we talk about separate out envy against each other. And if they don't, they fail. And there are a lot of partnerships that fail. And often people think, well, why aren't there evil people that have partnerships? You know, why didn't Hitler have a partner? This one and that. Well, generally, evil people don't have partnerships because they turn on each other. So. You know, it's hard to have a long, and I'm talking about long, sustained, 20, 30 year partnerships. But each one of these partnerships share that, what I was talking about in the, in the creativity in a box, or in this one adding certain values to the other, or one being a check on the other. I mean, if you take Valentino, who I study, this is a great love story. J Valentino, I mean, I think it's a great love story. Uh, is trained in France as a couture designer. He moves back to Italy, his father 
kind of sets him up. Uh, he goes into a restaurant. He meets this guy, Giancarlo Giametti. They then become friends, with parentheses. They go off for a weekend. They come back. Valentino says, Giancarlo, why don't you come work at my company? He says, OK. This is 55 years ago. Within four months, the company goes under. For the next 55 years, Giancarlo Giametti brings him out of bankruptcy, runs that company, runs every aspect of that company except the creative. And Valentino is the bigger-than-life iconic figure with this shadow, fi shadow figure in the background, Giancarlo Giametti. For, I guess, the first four or five years, they were, they were very personally involved with each other, but for the next 45, they were business associates. They were uh, extremely, extremely close and extremely successful. You take Ron Howard and Brian Grazer. Ron Howard is the director. Brian Grazer, the producer. There is a respect and love for each other that is unbelievable. And they have worked together magic. When they went to make the deal, Brian said to Ronnie Howard, who I know from Happy Days, and you all know from Happy Days. I mean, I cast him in Happy Days. But uh, he's been a big television star. He became a fairly big director. And directors in Hollywood are by far the more important and usually the bigger earners. So Brian said, let's be partners. You'll be 60%, I'll be 40%. Ronnie said, OK, went home, came back the next day and said, Cheryl, my wife doesn't like it. We're 50-50. And they've been 50-50 partners, even though you would think it should be weighted toward the director. In the end of the day, it's equaled out, because Brian has done television shows that Ronnie hasn't been involved with. Ronnie has done movies that Brian hasn't been involved with. And together, they have just done terrifically. So each one of these relationships, whether it's Ian Schrager, who was the financial guy with Steve Rubell and Studio 54, they both lost their way. They bo the, the box got broken up. The feds came and found cash in their car. They went to jail. They went to the same jail cell. They sat in jail together, and they decided what they had done wrong. They came out of jail, and they invented a new life and the whole boutique, upscale hotel uh, situation. So. This idea of extreme compatibility, extreme trust, extreme uh, egocentricity left at the door creates what I think is a effective and a reasonable way to look at things. So when I finally end up thinking about what would I advise people, what would I advise schools, what would I advise colleges to try to encourage, it would be to share, to find a partner. Obviously, we all try to find a life partner, but I'm talking about work going together with life partner. Work and love, which Freud and others have said are the ultimate goals toward happiness. So I, I kind of come down to the fact that if people were able to find partnerships, they keep their moral hat on correctly. They check each other out as far as uh, excess, not only excess in ideas, but an excess in ways things are done. It doesn't tend to quelch risk-taking and eccentricities and uh, exaggeration, because you wouldn't have two people that were exactly the same as partners anyway. And I would say the last thing, which is, to me, the most important reason why I would recommend that we all look for partnerships, other than the fact that if you have a partnership at the top, like you had at Home Depot with Bernie Marcus and Arthur Blank, then partnerships get created all through the institution, and there's more synergy in your institution. It was true at Disney. It was true at Home Depot. It's true at other partnerships that I've looked at. I mean, Joe Torrey was a mediocre manager until Don Zimmer, his bench coach, came in. Don Zimmer 
was a big risk taker. He encouraged Joe Torrey to be a risk taker, but under conservative umbrellas. And once they came together, they won four World Series out of five years, neither of whom had won any alone. But the bottom line is happiness. There was a Harvard longitudinal study that, that looked at graduates from Harvard from 1939, 1940, and 1941, Jack Kennedy's class, and have been looking at them for 70 years. Every five years, they study these graduates. Now, granted, they're men, because it was single sex, and well-educated. And they try to determine what made happiness. And the conclusion was it wasn't exercise, it wasn't wealth, it wasn't non-fat food, it wasn't sugar-free candy. It was, number one, a sustained relationship over many decades with a spouse or a business partnership. Number two was staying in touch with that sibling that many people would like to ignore. We all have that sibling, right? And the third was bestowing insights and knowledge to the next generation. But the number one thing on partnerships that became apparent to me was that they create a healthy, happy life. So my concluding statement would be that if you can find a partner, and sometimes you find one, like in marriage or in business that doesn't work, move on. That's a whole other speech. But as far as the successful possibility of finding a partnership, it will make you happier. It will make you more ethical. And I think at the end of the day, um, it will end up, as those songs were in the beginning, in a more beautiful life. So thank you very much. Michael, during your tenure at Disney, you raised revenue from $1.5 billion to $31 billion. You did terrific things there. But you also weren't shy about making enemies there as well. And so the question for you is, how do you know when you go into a new company who to make an enemy and who to make a partner? How do you make that division? Well, you don't, like, say, okay, today I'm going to make four new enemies. That'll be my, have my scorecard. Um, if you do your job right and you stay in a moral compass and you don't let accountants and lawyers or people who have their own agenda talk you into something that you know is incorrect, they may be your enemies. At Disney, we never had an ethical problem. We never had an accounting problem. We never had a leverage problem. Because if it didn't smell right, forget what the lawyer said, we didn't do it. And I would say the singular most difficulty I had was trying not to compromise on those issues. A few of them may have been wise for a small compromising just to keep peace in the house. But the older I got and the slightly more arrogant I got, and Frank Wells had died in a helicopter crash, and I wasn't going to compromise my points of view. So so that often creates, you know, ill will. Also, when you, you make 20 movies a year, you make hundreds of television shows, you do four theme parks, five theme parks. You're offered thousands of each. Saying no morning, noon, and night is not always the easiest thing to do. Um, I know that post-Disney now, uh, currently you're investing heavily in production and distribution of videos on portable media and so on. So what's next for you? Well, I bought a company uh, that I thought had a, the kind of brand attributes that we discussed before, with the, the pointillism, uh, Surat kind of thing, called Tops, which is when you, if you're at least a male and you remember in a Proustian way opening those cards and smelling that pretty bad bazooka chewing gum. It's in your body. It's part of your DNA. So we bought Tops, and we're trying to bring it back, and we're doing a pretty good job at it. I do a video company called Vuguru for internet video. I have a show on television called Glenn Martin DDS. I'm just coming out with uh, sounds like a resume. I'm coming out with a social game, a, 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 a like Farmville, 
a browser game through MySpace and Facebook, which is called Fame Town, where you can play a game and be part of Hollywood. You can be a waitress, and then you can get a screen test, and then you can get into a B movie, and then you can get into a better movie, and maybe you get on the A list. And if you really got a good publicist and pay him this fantasy money, they'll keep the paparazzi away, and maybe you'll stay out of drug rehab and Betty Ford. <laughs> so it's a fun game. It opens on my uh, Facebook November 1st. And are you doing these with partners? Oh, yes. I have a, uh, I still have the same partner who tells me, boy, that's a stupid idea, but I have I, my wife. Um, <laughs> and then I, uh, I convinced, uh, I think all my partners together add up to my own age, uh, and there are four of them. Uh, one I dragged away from Disney, who was about to go to business school, and I went and met with his parents and convinced his parents that it would be better to come with me than go to business school. That's the anti-education piece of this program. Um, but he's learning a lot. And I have, I have Sean Fanning, who, uh, who created Napster, you may recall, was really the beginning of file sharing. Uh, his uncle convinced him that music should be free. He was 17 years old. And so he believed his uncle. And the courts finally shut him down. And he ended up with nothing. But he's a genius. And he's now learned that there are copyright rules and, <laughs> and uh, international uh, 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 you know, IP uh, uh, is a reasonable sense to try to pursue. So I have a bunch of. And then I have three sons who are on any one day really making me pleased in their business ventures, which I'm helping with, and any one day drive me completely insane, <laughs> as normally children do. Go see the Fantastics. All right, another hand for Michael Eisner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.